Awesome. Well, this is uh, Greg Smith with Pearl Solutions Group. I'd like to welcome everyone to our webinar today. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'd like to thank uh, Evan Bunshu with GBNA uh, for being with us. Um, super excited about our webinar. Uh, Evan's got a ton of information, a ton of value I think you'll see today. So Evan, welcome, welcome to the webinar. Thank you, Greg. Appreciate you coming. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I appreciate everyone coming today. And let's move on to the next slide. Uh, so Pearl Solutions Group is an IT company based in St. Louis, uh, been around for 26 years. Uh, we serve small to mid-sized businesses in the Midwest for uh, technology solutions. Uh, we are passionate about technology. We love technology. I call us geeks. Uh, it's how we like to sell, solve business problems for companies of every size. Um, we also like to be approachable. We're IT people that you can talk to. We try to solve day-to-day -day business issues along with trying to make sure they are aligning with your long-term business goals. Evan? So GBNA, who are we? We are a third generation, family-owned independent brokers located in New York, just north of the city. If any of our um, watchers here in the local area come on in and visit. Um, we focus on all lines of professional and management liability, which would include cyber, you'd hope, since I'm on this call, um, errors and omissions, which is also professional liability, directors and officers, d &O insurance, which is a very important and often overlooked coverage, uh, crime insurance, and employment practice liability as well, which has been a hot topic during COVID. Um, in terms of our insurance company access, we have broad market access. I think 98% plus of the carriers out there, so we have access to the Chubbs, the Beasley, the Excels, Coalition, Specialty Lloyd Syndicates. Um, this allows us to kind of fully market, you know, canvas the marketplace when our, you know, new clients or existing clients need to reshop their insurance. So it kind of avoids calling multiple brokers in order to make sure that you're saturating the market. Uh, we have some great insights on our website, but we've also contributed a bunch of content to a number of different publications, such as Bloomberg BNA. I think we have some pieces up on info security, um, Harvard corporate governance. So we write and we, we try and contribute to the community. Um, lastly, I think we believe we provide a unique, kind of a unique value to the SME sector. We provide more attention than a top 10 broker. A lot of people think, you know, go out there and contact a top 10 broker, which oftentimes, unless you're paying 200,000, you're going to fall by the wayside, get a junior broker, and you may not get the attention you deserve or need. And we have more specialty product knowledge than a generalist broker. So if you were to contact your local broker that does your home and auto insurance or general commercial insurance, oftentimes they don't um, understand cyber or DNO. So we kind of come in there to, to fit that niche. Awesome. And uh, based off of our conversations, Evan, I would agree with everything you're saying. You guys have uh, been great. You know cybersecurity and all those risks around for how it affects small and mid-sized businesses. So I think it's going to be a great conversation. Appreciate that. Thanks. Uh, so Evan and I, when we were putting together a slide deck, we wanted to not just talk about cybersecurity insurance and what that means and how you'd be covered. We thought it was important to help everyone understand uh, cybersecurity as well. So we have a few slides that'll kind of help you understand uh, cybersecurity, what that world looks like and what it means and why it matters. And then we'll talk about how the insurance world fits into all of that as well. So. And we have a slide here we have to put together because a lot of our small to mid-sized customers uh, think that they're too small uh, to be affected, right? They're, no one cares about them. There's not enough money to be made, which is just not true. Uh, they believe that the stuff they have in place today or their IT person or partner or company they're using or, you know, the manager has been putting stuff in place uh, is good enough. And it, it's just not. Um, expect personal devices, lower percentage of, of overall budget, they don't care about it, right? You're not spending money. Our customers don't necessarily spend the same amount of money as like a Target or a Walmart or a, a bigger company uh, to protect themselves. So these are very important to understand because they, uh, every single person we talk to in the small mid market place um, believes these sort of things. So it's very important to understand the myths. Uh, so there's a lot of information here, but if you were to look at the slide and as an executive in an organization, 
Like you know that you're going to have email. You're going to probably have a CRM application. You're going to have some type of phone system or phone devices for your employees. You're going to have a bank account. You're going to have some type of payroll account. Uh, you're going to have QuickBooks, some ERP systems, some social media uh, applications that maybe your marketing person is using. All of these require passwords, right? All these require logins, not just for you, but your employees, past employees as well. And so if you think about all of these, what are the odds, if you're like most companies, not every single person has a unique password, not every person or company is changing their passwords. They don't have a policy in place for managing the passwords. And what you're going to find out is that there's probably a lot of shared emails out there, out on the market, and they're not really changing them. So you have some exposure maybe in ways that you don't even think about. And so the whole idea of the slides to help you see and understand that there's probably areas that you need to go back and think about. If you had a controller, for example, that had access to your business at, uh, banking application that maybe is no longer there, even from several years ago. And we'll talk about some of that stuff coming up as well. Ev, you want to add anything to this slide? Um, not this slide, no. Okay, awesome. So statistics, cyber statistics. No cyber presentation would be complete without some, some numbers. Um, I'm not a huge fan of numbers. There's a lot of differing information out there, and it's hard to kind of get one concrete. Everyone seems to disagree. I think these are good averages here. Um, I do think they're a little dated. These numbers might be a little bit more reflective of what you'd see from 2018, 2019, and I think the next slide kind of backs up some of that um, or corroborates that. But let's go through these quickly. So uh, roughly 2,200 attacks per day. Again, it can kind of be hard to conceptualize what that means. Average ransomware payment, 42,000. That has gone up uh, 2021. Now I think it's closer to 200,000. Average cost of data breach for companies of all sizes, 200,000. 43% uh, of breach victims are small businesses, and 90% breaches occur during non-working hours. So I think key takeaways here are, as Greg mentioned before, you're not too small to fly under the radar. There's plenty of um, SME companies that are being heavily targeted, and these attacks are costly uh, and getting costlier. And I think a lot of SMEs don't realize that it could just take one large attack or it doesn't have to be the largest attack, but a sizable attack, which can bankrupt your company. Um, how likely, you know, it's debatable, but it, it could easily put you out of business. Well, and, so I and think I think this was going, important, right? I think that I think that it's it's debatable, right? You don't know, but just thinking about forty two thousand dollars being the average ransomware cost, uh, that alone, if you get one of those, how much does that impact a small business from a revenue perspective? And think about ninety percent happening after working hours. You're not even there, right? Computers might be turned on. You, you think you're safe. Doors are locked. You know, lights are out. But people outside of your organization that are trying to attack you. Or attacking at times that you're not even paying attention. And that 42,000, as we'll see on the next slide, that's gone up. I think it's now closer to 200,000. So um, think 200,000. What has the average cost of data breaches of, you know, for companies of all sizes gone up? If that's gone up fivefold, say 1 million, again, these numbers are all very operation dependent, industry dependent, but um, they're larger than this. And I think that it kind of highlights the fact that not many companies may be able to afford a $500,000 ticket um, if they got hit with a, an attack. Well, and as an example, we had uh, someone we were talking to a week ago. They were hacked. Uh, they they uh, paid $150,000 in their attack, and they won't get it back. They didn't have the appropriate cybersecurity insurance or policy in place for the business. So they're, they're out that money. $150,000 is is very significant to a small, any small to mid-sized business. Yeah, it's, 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 it's large. All right. Uh, so if we take a look here, I think, you know, trends, trends are, I prefer trends over statistics just because they show the trajectory and where things are headed. Um, it's absolutely astonishing how much everything has grown since, you know, in the last four years. I mean, if this was our stock portfolios, none of us would be on this, on this call right now. Everything's gone up. <laughs> you know, 26 X. Um, right. But yeah, this is, this is, it's scary. It's scary data, but it's real data. Uh, so if we, if we look down towards the left here, ransomware payments, these are the average payments. You'll see they, the previous slide said somewhere around 42,000. Again, that's kind of more indicative of what you'd see in 2019. 
if you just fast forward to 2021, you're over 200,000. So yep. the ransomware payment has grown significantly. Um, and it's also affecting, they're affecting larger companies. So if you look at the, you know, employee count, it's mm-hmm. important to note that most of the companies have between 50 and 200 employees. Uh, so they are affecting larger and larger SMEs. Uh, so it, it's, I think a lot of your callers or your, your um, people you know, watching the video here and your clients might fall within that sweet spot. So it's important to know, you know what the trends are. Um, moving on to the next slide here, FBI reported losses. This, this data, I do believe they mixed in some um, email account compromise losses as well, which would be attacks against individuals, not just businesses. Mm-hmm. But you can still see the trajectory, I mean, from 2015 to 2019, and I wish it would go on to 2021, but it's going up and it's increasing more and more and more. Um, and if people, you know, for watchers that are not familiar with business email compromise or BEC claims, business email compromise, also known as CEO fraud, is a uh, an attack where you receive an email from a reported higher up in the organization asking for funds to be transferred, but the transfer request is essentially a fictitious account. So, mm-hmm. you know, you might get an email from a CEO asking for a transfer of, you know, $200,000. You, you think it's real, it looks real, you wire the money, and you're out that money. Um, they're getting very sophisticated. Uh, one of my friends that's a securities broker dealer got hit with one of these, and it was, I mean, it makes your, your, your the hair on the back of your, you know, head raise. They knew everything. They timed it when he went out to lunch. They knew which restaurant he was going to. They knew who wow. he was meeting with. And they they timed it perfectly, and they didn't send a request. They called in. They called in the um, the transfer. So they're getting extremely sophisticated, um, and they're and they're getting more and more common. So it's definitely something you gotta keep an eye out for. Yeah, and we actually have customers that have had those exact email issues, right? It's not just ransomware, right? It's email attacks, spoofing, and phishing, and a bunch of other technical terms that. These people do know what they're doing. We have a slide that even talks about this, kind of the behavior and the intelligence they have and how they're behaving. But I do love your one that's called striking oil. It, it is. I mean, they, and that's why they're looking at, at least based on our experience, looking at companies that are a little over 50 employees and up to 200. Because again, though that area is where they maybe have an internal IT person or someone helping them. They're not sophisticated, but they have money, right? And they don't really necessarily care about the data. They care about getting a payment so you're not, you get back to work. And so it's, it's very, I like, I like the way this, that's worded. Very smart. And, you know, we actually, I got, we got hit with um, one that I caught, but it was, it was odd because the email request that we received, I forgot who it was from, but it had a whole chain of the conversation between me and this person back and forth with my email signature yep. going down the yep. entire thread with an invoice on top. I mean, they had my email signature and they repeated it through a whole conversation to try and actually fool us into this wire. Um, but yeah, it, it's, they're getting scary. That's the exact scenario this, this person, this company we're talking with uh, did. They, they emailed back and forth. They thought it was all legit invoicing back and forth. I mean, they, they thought they're talking to the executives and they and they you know they paid the invoice. They wired the money because they thought they were paying a legit invoice, all because of an email conversation of a very sophisticated hacker. Which yeah. may or may not have. I mean, it probably didn't happen that conversation. It could have been completely false. Right. right exactly. Exactly. Crazy stuff. So industries in North America reporting ransomware attacks last year. Uh, I found this this interesting. And again, you get differing data out there. But I found it interesting that um, you're seeing manufacturing and construction companies sitting at the top of this list, along with government organizations. I would think they'd be a little bit lower, somewhere towards the middle. But you know, 15% of government organizations have reported a ransom attack. 13% of manufacturing companies and 13% of construction companies. Um, I just I, I wanted to include this because I think that I think a lot of our watchers here may fall into these sectors, and I was actually surprised that. Um, how affected they are by by ransom attacks. A lot of people think, you know, it's just the companies that have, you know, protected information that are, are getting hit. But, um, you know, not many people realize construction manufacturing are being heavily targeted as well. It, it's huge. As a matter of fact, we're talking to a uh, manufacturing company right now about becoming a customer, and we're getting ready to bring on a construction company as a customer. So, in our market, it's it's very relevant. So, yeah, I'm glad you appreciate you sharing the slide. It's it's definitely 
uh, in the areas where um, we, we focus on for sure. So how are these tax carried out? How are you know the most common, I guess, methods of uh, ransomware infections carried out? And this is where, Greg, you guys, of course, come in handy to put some um, defensive measures in place. But spam phishing emails, obviously, is, is one of the largest ones. And I already gave an example of, of how detail they can be with the you know fraudulent conversation email signatures going back and forth they get mm -hmm. very very in depth i think that i also read um recently that a lot of these attackers are now using artificial intelligence as well to basically pinpoint the weakest links the employees most likely to open those emails and even kind of pinpoint time so who's most likely to open it when are they most likely to open it and um they're using AI as well. I mean, companies are using AI, the hackers are using AI. So they're getting more and more effective through creative means. Um, numbers, the, the second, third, and fourth, lack of cybersecurity training, weak passwords, and poor user practices, gullibility, that all kind of falls under, you know, um, weak employee and organizational training, which is mm -hmm. huge. Huge. Oftentimes these, these hacks, um, you know, an untrained employee really is the organization's weakest link, and it's the most likely, you know, again, going back to phishing emails, it's going to take someone to open that phishing email, so you could even include that within the umbrella of, you know, weak employee training. Absolutely. So I yeah. think that you need, you need trained employees, you need them to understand what to open, what not to open, and you need to have the proper protocols in place. Um, so, yeah, I think that's the, the training aspect is huge. Well, and I think with the slides important that, you know, a while back, you know, five, six plus years ago, everyone talked about servers and firewalls, all this technical infrastructure behind the data center stuff. And it's, it's not like that anymore. It's not now it's really gone yeah. 100% the other way to where it's out in front of all the users. And so it, it is by far, I would agree with you, the number one thing to do is to train your, your employees um, on what look what to look for, right? And then if, if, if something doesn't look right or smell right, make a phone call and talk to somebody. And you know, I I kind of had this conversation with another cyber um, expert as well in our in our circle. And I think that these times, I don't know how many of your of the you know watchers now are um, or people on the call are inundated with work. I know that you know there's a em employment shortage, and a lot of companies are working harder and harder and harder, and some of their work staff are becoming more and more fatigued. And I think that the more overworked your employment staff is and the more fatigued you are, the more likely these attacks are to succeed because, you know, you've, you've worked a, a nine, ten hour day, you're exhausted, you receive an email, you're more likely to click on that than if you're refreshed and sharp. So I think that the fatigue adds an element of um, vulnerability. Yeah, I agree with that. Absolutely. Overwhelmed, trying to get work done, making mistakes, trying to get, just trying to get certain things done. The invoice looks right. The email looks right. You're not paying attention. Um, yeah, and you miss it. Absolutely. I agree. So some real world examples. Um, a lot of these examples, except for the last two, and I've included them all for kind of their own reasons, but a lot of these real world examples are larger companies, and that's only because it's not easy to find um, data points on smaller companies. You, the ones you find are generally the higher end companies. It doesn't mean smaller companies aren't being affected, but um, to find any information on real world examples for smaller companies is a little bit more difficult. But starting with Colonial Pipeline, which we've all heard of, um, they suffered a ransomware attack that locked down part of their IT system. They had to kind of do a precautionary shutdown, which interrupted their supply chain. You saw the you know lines, people lined all up over. for gas. Absolutely. And um, they decided, and as a lot of companies do, a lot of companies, especially the larger mid-sized companies, are, they say pay the ransom. It's, it will be cheaper to pay the ransom than it would be in terms of suffering the lost revenue as a result of downtime, the potential of losing suppliers and remediation and so forth. So it's easier to oftentimes pay the ransom. I forget the statistic. I think 80% or more actually pay the ransom. So hmm. they did pay four mil. I think that they did wow. recover two and a half or three of it. Um, and Greg, I think you told me that you learned that this was purchased for what five dollars. Yeah, this is, we're going to talk about this in a little bit, but yeah. The, so the the Colonial Pipeline was based off of someone buying an account uh, information off of the dark web for five bucks. Yep. Yeah, we're going to we're going to cover that. Yeah, <laughs> right, exactly. 
which is growing. Um, JBS Food Processing, I think it was a month or two later, they hit again. Uh, the food processing company resulted in a $11 million ransom payment. I mean, do the math on that. If they're paying an $11 million ransom payment, they were projecting the losses to be in excess of that if they didn't pay. So these, again, can get very costly. I think the two important points to note on both of these are these some people may not consider uh, like Colonial Pipeline or JBS to be a you know a ideal target for a ransomware attack because they don't have PII or protected information mm-hmm. or anything confidential per se. But um, the manufacturing companies they got hit they got hit hard and it shut them down. And not only that, but it then in turn affected the U.S. supply chain, which I think is uh, in large part drew a lot of regulatory attention, which is why now you're seeing the Department of Treasury and the current administration really honing in on this because it kind of woke up the public as to, you know, you think ransomware attack is affecting the company. Well, now they're starting to affect the public, mm-hmm. and um, it's an interesting shift. Interesting. So yeah. going, on, going on to Boeing here, uh, Boeing, there was an employee error that resulted in 36,000 employee records. I bring that up because a lot of, again, a lot of, um, a lot of people think that cyber liability, cyber attacks originate from the outside. There are external threats, but there are also internal threats. Um, employee error is one, and that would be covered under a cyber liability policy. DuPont, same thing, right down there below, rogue employee. That's an internal threat. So you have the external actors and you have the internal mistakes or actors. So cyber policies uh, do cover both of those. But in DuPont's example here, they stole uh, 40,000 sensitive R&D documents and IP for a competitor. I do want to note um, theft of IP is the one the one main, I think the largest exposure that would not be insurable under a cyber policy or any policy. Theft of IP and the resulting loss of losing that IP is extremely difficult to quantify. I'm not aware of any insurance companies that have <laughs> jumped on and said we'll provide insurance for the you know lost income or the damages resulting from the theft of your IP, so something to keep in mind. Um, Turner Construction, again, you wouldn't think of a construction company to you know truly be affected, but they were breached, uh, let's see, breach exposed current and former employee records. Um, I bring this up for two reasons. Again, it's a construction company. Typically, construction companies don't think of cyber liability in that context, but also employee records. It's important, and I think we touch on this in a later slide, but it's important to remember mm-hmm. that if you have employees, you have protected information. And the more employees you have, the more protected information you have. So that was a, a fairly large breach for them. Uh, moving down, Buffalo Public Schools. Ransomware stole 34,000 student records, and then moving down again, Treasure Island Homelessness Charity suffered a month-long business email compromise attack, resulting in $625,000 loss. That's that's a very long time, a month long, you know, resulting in a $625,000 loss. That's big. Now these are two smaller entities, right? Buffalo Public Schools. You could argue they're they're not tiny, but they're not Turner Construction or Boeing. And the homelessness charity, again, these are smaller, um, on the smaller scale, but they're getting hit. And, um, you know, again, you're not, you're never too small to fly under the radar. Absolutely. Well, we have uh, some of the example I used with this person, um, email back and forth. Um, they are like less than 15 employees. We have another customer in town that's sub 15 employees. Um, they, they actually had another email exchange back and forth and they wired a bunch of money. Uh, luckily, they got it back, but it, it's definitely impacting companies of every single size, uh, for sure. So uh, those are really good world examples. Great. And there's a, there we have equal number of small customer examples uh, throughout the Midwest that we're talking to on a regular basis is happening to. So it's, it's happening everywhere. Okay, so Evan kind of talked to us a little bit, and I'm going to go through a kind of a hacker timeline at a very high level. So uh, as he said, uh, people are getting very sophisticated. The hackers are getting very sophisticated. They're actually hiring developers for an average salary of $750,000 a year because of what they can make. You saw all the money that's being paid. Uh, we're going to talk about it more a little bit, but here, here's a timeline of what uh, uh, an ordinary hacker or kind of how they look at things. They take a look at every single organization. Again, like I said, these customers that we're talking about, 15 employees or less, uh, they look at a 90 day window. So they think about, they plan their attack, they do a research, they figure out who you are, uh, figure out how they're going to get in, um, who am I, where am I, um, who are they as an employee, right? Who are they going to 
emulate, who are they, what do they want to learn, what do they want to get to, and they're watching emails. They come in, they watch emails, they see what's going on, they're learning who's doing what, they understand who the executives are already because they've done the research maybe on LinkedIn, um, and they maybe want to do a virus, they want to try to change some emails, uh, and then they spread out. They start thinking about how do I get into other employees? How do I get into other servers around the thing? Um, and then they start looking about, okay, how am I going to store the network? How am I going to do the ransomware? How am I going to make this thing work? And so it, and it's, and they think about this with more and more regularity. There's more and more software that helps them figure this sort of thing out. So they know how to do this quickly um, every single day. So one thing you want to do from a software perspective, one example for this is that there is software on the market today that locks out or looks at these three areas, right? They look at for intrusion, they look for uh, enumeration, they look for lateral spread. So if you have some software installed on all the computers in the organization, it cuts them off at the planning spot, right? So if they try to do an intrusion, if you have the right kind of software, it's going to see that and it's going to stop it. If you have the right type of software is not going to get through the enumeration. It's going to notice something. It's going to notice the behavior, and it's going to stop it. So there's software on the market that's available today. If you're willing and interested to do something about it, uh, it's available to help you. So I was at a conference uh, a few weeks ago and listened to the person on the right, Eric O'Neill, speak. And it's a really crazy, relevant story, I think. Um, at a conference, listen to this guy speak, but he was talking about this guy on the left. And I'm not sure if anybody knows who these people are. I didn't know when we began this process, but Robert Hansen uh, is really considered the most dangerous spy in US history. He was an FBI agent for 25 years. He was spying for Russia for 22 years of those five years. He was in charge of, uh, on the Russian spying. He was in charge of spying on Russia for the United States. Uh, and when Eric was 26 years old, uh, he was assigned uh, to actually uh, catch Robert. He was so sophisticated. Robert knew what he was doing that the FBI couldn't catch him. They knew eventually paid an informant $6 million to find out who it was, but that alone was not allowing them to capture Robert. And so Eric talked about those things and how they went about doing it. it ended up being a date on his PDA. So he had a personal PDA, if you remember those that back in the day, um, and that was the only way they were able to catch him. And it was a very interesting story. And the reason that's relevant is because Eric did that. He got out of the FBI and now he does cybersecurity. Now he focuses on cybersecurity and that's his expertise. And that's really what he talked about at this conference was cybersecurity and how it's impacting us today. It's almost, Cybersecurity is, new, is the new terrorist, it's the new spy, it's, it's the new version of Robert Hansen and how it's damaging the United States. So um, if you don't know, there's actually a movie based off of this on these two gentlemen called Breach. Uh, it's out on um, um, Amazon Prime if you guys want to see it. It's a very interesting story. Uh, it's kind of a very scary story. So why do I bring that up? It's because Eric O'Neill talked about the dark web. The dark web is very real. If you look at this example, this looks like an eBay. It looks like Etsy. It looks like Amazon Prime. This is a real environment. It's a real application that people are using your information to sell. And if you think about the dark web, Eric O'Neill talked about it from his business perspective. The dark web is the third largest economy in the world, right? You don't think about that because no one knows about it. It's kind of that quote unquote dark, dark web. But as we talked about before, as Evan talked about, right, the colonial pipeline was someone's ID, someone's account on here from colonial that wasn't even active anymore, but it was still out here and someone paid $5 to get it. And then based off of using that account, they were able to attack colonial pipeline and get in with easy access. And then as we talked about in the previous slide, they landed. Now, how do they, how do they branch out? How do they find out where those can go? How do they find out how they can lock down the entire organization? Uh, and that all started from a $5 uh, account that they found on here. Uh, some of the scary things you think about is that you can actually hire a hitman on the dark web. You can order new body parts on the, on the dark web. One story that he talked about that was really funny and kind of interesting is that kids are starting to hire criminals to attack their school so they can shut the schools down so they don't have to go to school. So it's crazy things that the dark web is real. And that's really what the goal for today is, is to 
everyone's probably heard about the dark web, right? You, you've heard us all talk about it or hear on the news, the dark web. This is what it looks like. This is literally what it looks like. It's a real place. And we're going to talk about a few more, a few more slides on this. Uh, here's just a snapshot of the dark web. Evan and I, when we were talking about putting the slide deck together, we wanted to show you the reality of what you see. It's, you know, there's a company called Gold Apple selling something. That company has five stars. They're, they have a trust level. So as the hackers are looking at buying something, obviously this is all illegal activity. So they're wanting to buy from a, a, an organization or a company or people that they can trust, right? It's no like trust, right? So they have all the features, how many views they've had, uh, and they're starting to move toward businesses because they know they're the money is that. If you, you know, personal identity is not the thing they're looking for, right? It's, it's how do I get identities inside of organization? Uh, and then as I talked about there is that it allows the hackers to feel like they're really not doing anything bad. They're quote unquote, uh, sticking to the man or sticking to the corporation. Evan, you wanna add anything to the slide? To um, yeah, in addition to purchasing, you know, credentials and credit card numbers and so forth, I think ransomware as a service is one of the fastest growing trends within the, you know, underworld there, the cyber underworld. And you can simply go online and you can buy the, you know, the software to breach or the instructions on how to install the, you know, ransomware or whatever attack, a DOS attack, whatever you're looking for, they'll give you the instructions, you buy for a certain price, and you know the vendor is trusted, um, here's the price. So it's not just the credentials, it's also the attacks themselves that you can actually buy on the dark mm -hmm. web. Yep. And what's important here is that we kind of talk about the payment, but it's, it's cryptocurrency, right? And so as long as cryptocurrency exists that you can't track, you don't know what's happening, the dark web's going to be a, a vibrant place to buy and sell. Uh, so there's another snapshot from the, from this. This is an example of uh, supply and demand. This is this is out of stock. The, the, it's so popular, people are buying so much of this that it's out of stock. And if you notice the word "fulls," F U L L Z of California business owners complete high credit scores, uh, this tells the person that's running to buy it that there's enough information provided to commit identity theft. So if you want to go commit identity theft against 300 people. It's right here. It's available. You get, you can purchase it right now. You can purchase one. You can purchase 300, whatever it might be. And then you can run with that and use the software. Um, you have the vendor. You have the class. Um, you have the different quantities. Just like you would have Amazon or any other area like an eBay or an Etsy or whatever. So it's – anyway, the, the value is to talk about is the, the dark web is, is valid. Uh, you want to understand how to monitor it. You want to understand how to pull your information off of it. And that's really the goal for Evan and I is to help you understand that you're, you're not alone. Uh, you don't, you're not, uh, you can stop what's on the dark web. You can remove your data off this dark web. So there's ways to protect yourself, learning what's out there and knowing what's out there. There's software that actually will search the dark web, find the information and help you protect your information and protect your organization and your employees. So cost of a data breach. Um, l let's start on the right side first, and then we'll go over to the left for a reason. So lost income and disruption of operations and lost reputation, that is um, by far the largest exposure and can create the most damage. Uh, the downtime of not being in business, the potential of lost customers, the reputational damage, potential of losing suppliers, it adds up and it adds up quick, and um, it by far is, is uh, and as we'll see on the left side, one of the most damaging aspects of a cyber attack. There's also hardware, software, and IP restoration costs. Obviously, the longer that takes to restore, the longer you're going to be down, the more lost income is going to you know, result from that. But there's costs, of course, with just getting that restoration done in itself. Um, if you have PII or PHI, protected information, corporate confidential information, there could be notification and credit monitoring costs as well. I don't know how many of our viewers are subject to those or not, but um, that's kind of on the smaller scale. Generally, you, know, you can set those up for a pretty minimal cost at the call centers and so forth, but that's another cost involved. A potential litigation, probably unlikely. We're not seeing too much of it, but we're seeing more and more. And litigation can be brought by consumers, investors. If you make any um, representations regarding the level of your security, investors you know, invest in your company as a result of trusting you, then they find out later you misrepresented your actual security measures. Investors can sue. Employees can sue if they're 
data was um, exposed for injury, uh, breach of contract, and so forth. So litigation, again, probably unlikely, but there's always a potential. Extortion demands, that's huge. Uh, again, if you're hit, most companies do want to you know, pay the demand, and they're growing and growing. So I think ransomware coverage and coverage for the extortion demands is extremely important. And then lastly, there could be, depending on who you're regulated by, whether it be statutory laws or, you know, if you're a securities broker dealer, FINRA, there's different regulatory bodies that you might be governed by, but any resulting forensic investigation, regulatory damages, uh, fines, penalties, all that, so that these are the costs that you could be hit with if you're hit with a breach or a number of breaches. Uh, on the left side now, if we just go down, these are the top costs according to industry accountants. So number one, reputational cost affecting future client relationships, 42%. 17% cost of customers moving away from the company. 15% cost of hiring expertise to mitigate further threats. 11% for PR costs to lessen the low to reputation. And lastly, 10% for cost of compensation claims and fines. This is interesting because if you add up the reputational cost is 42%, 17% of cost of customers moving away, and the 11% of PR costs to lessen the blow of the reputation, you're talking about 70% of the top costs that pertain to brand damage and lost clientele, which wow. are all first-party costs. So that's, that's, that's huge. Huge. Absolutely. Yeah. And then moving on to the um, next slide, I know we, there's a lot of confusion. We all hear the terms thrown around first party, third party. I'm coverage. confused. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Everybody's confused. Um, I had to explain this the other day, and I think what finally drilled the, the point home was my car accident analogy. Yep. So you're driving your car, you hit another car. There's damages on both ends. You damage your car, you damage their car. Uh, what happens? Your your auto policy provides liability coverage and collision coverage. The collision coverage is first party. That's damage to your property. You want to make yourself whole. The liability comes in because there's third party damage. You're now responsible for making the third party whole. So that's where the liability comes in. And some cyber policies are written, and that's where the term, that's why the term cyber liability policies has kind of fallen by the wayside. Mm -hmm. Because cyber liability policy uh, kind of implies that there is no first-party coverage, which on some policies there isn't. On poor policies, it is just liability only, so you're losing all those first-party coverages. But um, from a liability standpoint, that's where the third-party coverage comes in, the cost. And that could be uh, cost, the notification costs are third-party. I think actually, you know what, let's go to the next slide because I, we, we go through all of those insurance coverages, and I can outline what's your third, first party, sure, third sir. party. I have, I have a question first for you, though. So from a um, yeah. customer perspective from our companies, do they need to look, be looking at both? Is there, a, a, when you're looking at cyber or risk, they need to be looking at both of these scenarios, or is it one or the other? Or well, Yeah, yeah. I think that, um, again, the industry and the operations are going to dictate, but if we just, you know, recall what we learned from two slides ago, 70% of the top costs were all pertaining to lost income and lost clientele and reputational damage, potential of losing suppliers. That's all first party. 70% is first party. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I think that that's extremely important. I think for your clients, probably just based on the clients that I understand you might have, mm -hmm. um, being that they don't actually have any protected information, I think that the third party is extremely low on the radar. It's really mostly first party that um, they need to worry about. That's what I thought. That's why I wanted to ask that. That's what I wanted to clarify for our small mid-market companies and the verticals or industries that we focus on. It seemed like first-party coverage was the most important thing for them to think about. So I appreciate that. Absolutely. Yeah, it is. Okay. So, okay, we can just go down line by line here. We have already kind of outlined the damages. Now, what would a cyber policy cover? And we can, you know, discuss whether it's first or third party. So lost income, we've already talked about that. You're down, you're losing income as a result first-party coverage, right? You want to make yourself whole, you're losing money. Financial loss due to invoice fraud, which we've gone over. One of your clients has already sustained a, a claim. They wired money to a fraudulent account. First-party coverage, you want to make yourself whole. An extortion demand, you now have to pay, you know, the ransomware attacker in order to get your information back or your operation running again, first-party costs. So, I mean, just those top mm -hmm. three, those are three of the most, you know, concerning exposures. That's all first-party. Uh, required notification and credit monitoring costs, that's third party. A regulator is going to tell you you need to provide this now in order to, you know, make that third party whole. 
um, network data and restoration costs, first party, again, these are costs that you have to incur to get your operation back to where it was pre-loss. Um, media liability and IP infringement, a lot of clients might not realize that media liability is included, um, whether it's whether they think they'd actually be hit by a claim that um, could implicate this, probably unlikely, but if you have a website or you're doing any online publishing mm -hmm. and you're hit with a um, IP infringement, copyright infringement, a libel slander, online libel slander, you use the image or a photograph or something that you're not allowed to or a logo and you're sued for you know, uh, infringing on their IP, that is covered under a cyber policy. So just something interesting to note. That would be third party, again, because it would be a, a lawsuit or potential litigation. Uh, attorney's cost, that's a third party coverage. Forensic investigation, IT, and expert costs, that is it's kind of bordering on the first third party, depending whether it's, It you seems know, like required. a little bit of both, right? Yeah. Exactly. Uh, if it's required, if it's required by the um, regulators, then I, I would consider that third party. If it's something that you need to do uh, internally for yourself, that would be more of a first party. So damages and settlements relating to cyber litigation, again, probably unlikely, but if you are sued for many clients, customers, vendors, anything like that, that would be third party. Cyber policies also cover regulatory defense, investigation costs, fines and penalties, um, PCI fines, all that stuff is third party. And then lastly, there's a lot of miscellaneous, um, these kind of smaller claims that can generate some financial damage to an organization. Mm -hmm. Crypto jacking is um, being that the, <laughs> I just think, being that the price of crypto is going up and up and up and up, there are more attackers out there trying to mine crypto, and they can actually hack your computers to use your computers to mine that crypto. Wow. And what happens as a result, if you have a if you have a network of 300 computers, each computer is being you know has been affected with malware to install crypto jacking software. Now all of your computers are running 24/7 near max. They're going to break down pretty soon. Not only that, but they're going to generate uh, some additional utility costs as a result, right? So your electric bills are going to go up. So a lot of good cyber policies throw coverage in for that because we're seeing it more and more. It's it's on the rise. Um, that would be first party again because you're sustaining damages. You have the increased utility costs. You have the damage to your network. Uh, so I think that's it's it's important to note. Well, kind of. So if you can explain crypto jacking a little more because it, it you kind of mentioned it at a high level for for the people listening. Uh, it's about how it's taking over computers and using those computers. So you can talk about this a little bit. Yeah, um, you know, I'm not I, from a technical side. You yeah, might even not be better, technical, better, but, but just really high level because I cause I'm, I'm going somewhere level, with so, this. So. Yeah, so essentially you are tricked into or somehow you install malware on your computer system. You click a link, it installs malware on your computer system, which is crypto jacking. So basically that malware allows the hacker to use your computer to mine crypto. And when I say mine crypto, in order to mine crypto, there's it's a bunch of you know mathematical algorithms in order to verify the you know uh, ownership of these crypto accounts and so forth and in order to do that it takes tremendous processing power so in order to do these crypto algorithms and calculations uh, they need computer systems which is why they have these crypto you know farms where they have servers and servers and servers in order to, all they do all day long is just mine crypto um, and in order to do that they can install malware on your computer, take over your systems, and use those systems and your hardware power to actually do those calculations. Is that, am I kind of describing yep. it correctly, yep. Greg, or yep. would you add yep. anything yep. to it? No, it's exactly what I wanted to talk about. That's exactly right. And so, you know, but again, going back to that software, that previous slide about how the hackers take those 90 days, that that's one thing. But then you have people trying to do crypto jacking and trying to use those computers to do uh, do mining for them. And so they're really taking over your computers and you might notice some network lag and, and, and a bunch of different problems. But again, having the right kind of software in place will find those sort of things to protect your organization from multiple different levels of someone coming in doing something negative from your organization. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. And it's important to note, you know, just like directors and officers and, you know, professional liability insurance. Cyber is very nuanced. Um, a lot of people think, I got a cyber policy. I have the coverage. 
right. terms can vary significantly. So don't don't think that you got a cyber policy and you have crypto jacking coverage or you even have coverage for ransomware extortions. I mean, they really vary a lot. And I think we have a slide that will touch on that. But just keep yeah, but if I can add back. to that, though, for, for yeah. everyone listening, this the reason we have Evan on is because what you're hearing really is someone that understands cybersecurity insurance. A lot of brokers or your probably current company you work with they can all provide cybersecurity insurance. You fill out a form. We do this, right? You fill out a form and then they'll go tell you how much you're going to pay. But when Evan can help you, they get into the nuances of your business and understanding the ways that you need to be protected that matter to you. And they can craft the appropriate cyber insurance policy or some other way of protecting yourselves as well that he's talking about. So I, I appreciate that. It's good stuff. Yeah, thank you, Greg. So um, cyber risks without protected info, I wanted to just create this slide because, again, I think a lot of the visitors on this uh, webinar may not have protected info per se, and they may be under the assumption that I don't really have risk, I don't have protected info. Um, well, we've already demonstrated that ransomware can lock down and cripple your computer systems, make you inoperable, um, even websites. So it can affect your website's backups, lock down your databases, infrastructure critical systems if you're a manufacturer. Uh, they can affect your machinery and equipment. They can take your IP. They can you know, hold that hostage, whether that be flat designs, uh, blueprints, anything that you rely on, and steal employee records. You know, I'm, I also do, I was thinking about this myself, I do photography, and I have backups and backups and backups. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know what, if I was affected by a ransomware attack and someone said, I have all of your photos locked down, um, give me $5,000 or $2,500, I'd be tempted to pay it because I want that back. I mean, it right, just goes to show right. you that there's there's information that they have, even even though it's not protected, um, you can't you can't live or work without it. So it's it's um, you have to kind of shift your mindset in terms of what your actual exposure is. Well, but, that's, um, that's the whole purpose of today's uh, conversation, right? Is is it's again, it's you're shifting. We're all trying to shift. You know what we knew cybersecurity to be with servers and data centers is not the case. It's it's everything and anything related to an organization or a person. And it, me too. I have photography, um, a, a bunch of photography. I have probably probably at least several hundred thousand pictures that I've taken the family and different things or whatever over the years. And me, same thing with me. I would probably be thinking about that as well. And it's just it's just helping everyone understand how to think about cybersecurity and protecting yourself and your organization differently. So yeah. It's awesome. Absolutely. Um, and then again, I think we've touched on it before. Oh, you could go back one. Go back. Oh, to okay. Okay. Previous slide. I think there were two other bullet points. Um, again, just remember that the uh, employees' personal data is protected info. We've touched on this with the Turner Construction example. A lot of people think we don't have protected info, but if you have employees, you do have protected info. So keep mm -hmm. that in mind. Um, all organizations, as we've already touched upon, are subject to invoice manipulation. These fraudulent wire transfers that go elsewhere. Treasure Island, again, they, they lost up to $625,000. So, again, there's exposure without having protected info, and everybody's subject to invoice manipulation. Everybody. And last, everybody. Yeah. And it's, it's and we already showed how much it's growing. I mean, what is 26, 26 times what it was in 2015 or so? Yeah. It's almost the most important place. That's, that's I mean, that's exactly where they're going. It is, and you know what else is indicative of that is the fact that more and more insurance companies are trying to sublimit it. So if you if you watch the trends of insurance companies, it can also show you where they're getting concerned. And more and more insurance companies are having their increasing rates due to the ransomware attacks, and they're trying to sublimit the coverage on ransomware attacks and sublimit the coverage on business email compromise attacks. They don't want to offer the limits they used to uh, because – they're seeing a lot of claims there. So watching what the insurance companies do can also show you, you know, where the concerns are mm -hmm. and what companies are being affected by. Um, and then point. lastly, all organizations, again, are subject to these miscellaneous attacks like malware, the crypto jacking, and so forth. So I think um, there's, a, there's, there's still a considerable amount of exposure without having protected info. Absolutely. I totally agree. So... Um, other Greg, do you, do you need me to speed up by any chance? I know we're running over a little bit. Uh, uh, I think we're okay. Yeah, I think we can summarize and, and think about because we're okay. you and I are talking about a lot of different stories, which is really good. So I don't want to say lose that, but um, okay, well, I'll try and uh, go through it maybe a little bit faster. Um, so other insurance, not all cyber exposures need to be covered under a cyber policy. Uh, a lot of you'll, re you'll see this referred to as silent cyber. There's coverage elsewhere as well. So lawsuits by customers or vendors, which you touched upon before, 
potentially unlikely unless you have a, a huge, uh, you know, investor base. Those would be covered by a DNO policy, assuming that it doesn't have a cyber exclusion. A lot of policies can have these invasion of privacy cyber exclusions worked in, kind of hidden. So that can be covered by a DNO policy. Any privacy-related litigation brought by employees um, or damages sustained by them can be covered by an EPLI policy. Mm -hmm. uh, rogue employees committing internal theft and crimes can be covered by crime insurance. And then the same thing with these business email compromise and fraudulent transfer attacks. In fact, if you have a client that's just concerned about that, those exposures are actually better covered oftentimes by a crime policy, not a cyber policy, a crime policy with an appropriate social engineering endorsement. So again, you don't have to purchase a whole cyber policy in order to cover your exposures. Maybe the answer is a good EPLI policy and a good crime policy. Uh, and you can kind of bypass the cyber entirely, if, especially if you know most of that exposure is third party, which you don't have the third party risks. And then lastly, um, your software storage and other tech solutions fail if you're a you know, software provider or you're providing any sort of cloud storage solutions. If those solutions fail and data is exposed, that would be covered by an E&O policy, a professional liability policy, which oftentimes they dovetail with cyber. A lot of the companies, because they kind of go hand in hand. Yep. But um, yep. the point here is that not all exposures need to be covered solely by a cyber policy. It's, it's the most important thing, right? The business emails, the compromise you can do with the with the crime policy, with with the social engineering endorsement. That's 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 important to understand. And then we made this um, this little chart because oftentimes clients have a question of what coverage do I need, what limits are adequate. Cyber policies, to a certain degree, can be built a la carte, so you can say. I need coverage A, B, C, I need these limits, let's sublimit here, let's increase limits here. Um, so, and I'd be happy to, you know, email any of this to your clients if they're interested so they can kind of yeah. do a self-assessment. But if you just kind of go line by line, you can see, you know, protected info. If you have protected info in your custody, you're going to be subject to breach response coverage, first party, lost income, cyber extortion, and all the highlighted areas. Mm -hmm. um, if you're only, let's see, let's, let's use a better example here. Um, if you are only concerned about electronic invoicing and payments, you can just go right down that line. You would need, you potentially need regulatory defense if you're in a regular, if you're operating in a regulated, mm -hmm. uh, you know, statutory environment or anything. Hardware and uh, data restoration, e-crime, which we've already talked about. So, again, you can kind of go down each one of these questions and say, do I have protected info? Am I involved with media, online media activities? Am I dependent on IP? And then you can kind of check off what your exposures are, and then build your cyber policy from there. That's awesome. I it makes it easier to understand, right? When I go through, when I was going through this, I didn't really have this available to me as I'm thinking about how I can protect Pearl and our customers. So it's definitely very helpful. Good high level information. And then lastly, for me, I think, um, you know, the question comes up, a lot of clients have a commercial package or a business owner's policy. And companies can add cyber endorsements to those policies. Oftentimes they're very inexpensive and the question comes up, well, is that sufficient or should I get a standalone policy which are more expensive? So just kind of touching on what those differences might be. Um, a cyber endorsement may cost you $500 to $1,500 per year if you're looking at like a one mil limit. A standalone policy is gonna be somewhere in the 1,000 to 4,000 ranges or very rough numbers, but just to give you some idea. Um, the policy limits on endorsements are generally lower. They may be sublimited to 250 or 500K. Sometimes they will go up to 1 million, but um, standalone policies can go 1 mil, 2 mil, 3 mil, 4 mil. You can even build them in towers and get three carriers involved if you need 10 or 20 million. Um, and on a side note, which I should mention, if any of your clients receive cyber compliance requirements from outside parties, um, we have found that oftentimes those parties set very high limits. So we've seen manufacturers and professional service providers get hit with, okay, we, you want to work with us? We need you to carry 5 mil or 10 mil in cyber coverage. And our first response is negotiate it down. Oftentimes, they'll set it very high and they'll come down pretty quick. Not always, but um, you can save yourself some money, especially if we don't see the exposure or the need for a 10 mil policy. Um, it's important to kind of have that conversation first before you approach the market because you may be saving yourself some, some money there. Um, yep. Coverages on an, on an endorsement, 
they're generally very basic. Again, they could be limited only to third-party coverage. You could be missing out on the you know 70% of the exposure that you actually have, which is all first-party. Standalone policies are going to have very, very broad first-party and third-party and all the endorsements for the crypto jacking, the privacy coverage if you, you know, inadvertently violate your own opt-in, opt-out, collect, you know, data collection uh, protocols and so forth. So standalone policies are much more broad. Um, endorsements will also generally have very narrow policy definitions. So they may say we define it as, you know, data being affected. What is data? Data is a date of birth, a name, a social security number, or a credit card. Um, well, what if you don't have any of that? You purchase, you, you think you're getting cyber, you pay $500, you get a $250,000 limit, it's third-party coverage only, and it's only covering if data affected is data birth social, which may, you may not even have. So that could be a completely illusory policy that you never use. Um, standalone policies have very, very broad definitions, so they'll include, you know, the corporate confidential information, any other data that you might be responsible for. Uh, breaches that affect third parties that you might work with outside vendors if that triggers a loss of income to you. So again, much broader definitions. And then lastly, the uh, requirement and terms under cyber endorsement are pretty stringent. So it's easy to inadvertently violate or not realize that you might not be meeting all the requirements if all of your data is not encrypted or you don't meet the uh, you know, very strict notification requirements. Coverage could be gone, whereas standalone policies, they're, they're more forgiving. They, um, they don't have the same requirements that these endorsements do. So it's important to know what you're getting when you go the endorsement route versus the standalone route. Okay. Hey, we have a few questions that came up in the chat. If you're willing to answer them, I think might, now might be a great time um, since you're through your slides. Uh, first one is, if I am a small company with less than 30 employees and minimal customer data, are there affordable policies available for that limited exposure? Let me, let me go back and read that uh, to myself. So if I'm a small company with less than 30 employees, so employee privacy, I mean, you have some data for your employees, of course, so it's small, but there's something there. Minimal customer data. Um, minimal customer data. I'd be curious to know what they mean by customer data is this are these individuals are these actually you know are there any socials health information records there or anything or is this customer data like a, a, a corporate customer probably corporate customer based on our customer base yeah minimal minimal customer data are there affordable policies for that limit so i guess i guess the best way to answer this question is um first party coverage is i think employee privacy jumps out at me, the CEO for business email compromise which you talked about and um, some ransomware coverage. You could, if it's that small, I think that you could go with low limits. You could sublimit mm -hmm. it to, you know, 250,000 or so with a standalone policy. Oh, okay. Generally, if your exposure is low, the premium should be lower, right? And the, that's how it's rated. I mean, the carriers aren't going to charge you an exorbitant premium if your exposure is very low. And cyber policies have gotten more and more affordable as, uh, as time has gone on. So I think, yeah, there would be absolutely, and I guess, you know, the term affordable is debatable. One person might find affordable, another <laughs> might not. But um, <laughs> right. yeah, they're out there. Okay. So did you see the other two questions? I think yeah, am I responsible for ensuring against attacks on my vendors that may have exposed my business data? I think that what you should be doing is ensuring that your vendor also has the proper insurance in place, getting certificates of insurance from them and placing mm. requirements on your vendors that they carry the right insurance. So whether that be um, e and or cyber or a combination of both, you want to make sure any vendor, and that there's a whole online, there's tons of vendor checklists on how to do due diligence on the vendors that you're working with, but you want to make sure that you're working with insured vendors that have the proper security protocols in place. Um, so hey, if you could day. if you could share something we, the one we just talked about today, right? It was their vendor that was exposed. If there's something you can share to me via email, Cindy will send that out in our next uh, newsletter that goes out for um, something to kind of them to see to look at. If there if you have something we like that, something that would be a while back. I'll I'll see if we can locate that. I don't think we um I don't know if we ever published it, but we did have a slight guide. I'll, I'll see if I can forward okay. that to you, Greg. Okay, awesome. Um, but are you responsible for ensuring a tax? So I guess. In your example, the one that you gave before, it was an attack on their vendor. Mm -hmm. uh, are they responsible for that attack? They're not responsible for the attack, but they're out the money. So it really comes down to, are they okay uh, kind of self-insuring for that 
potential, mm-hmm. right? So if you're working with these vendors and one of those vendors is attacked and you do fraudulently wire 150000 or 250000 are you okay at night knowing if that happens to me, you know, I'll be out that money. We can incur that. We have enough on the balance sheet to incur that hit. Uh, we're all right. Mm-hmm. Or do we need a crime policy or a cyber policy to cover that? But I don't think anyone's going to force you to get that coverage. Okay. Uh, also, when vendors are attacked, it's important to note that if there is a cyber attack, it can result in downtime to you. So if you're, if you're reliant on a vendor and they're down for a month because they got hit with a ransomware DOS attack, now you can't operate because you can't rely on that vendor. You're down for a month. Right. Um, good cyber policies will cover the contingent business loss, income loss, as a result of um, that breach. So, again, it's not something that you're responsible for, but it's something that you should be diligent in covering, knowing that there's a potential that you could suffer financial damages if that vendor is affected. Right. Okay. Awesome. Um, what does a response what does a response look like from an insurance company when I have been taxed? Yeah, that's a good question and how the whole thing plays out. I think you know there are with this going back kind of to the endorsements and the standalone policies, a lot of the endorsements require you to control the claims process. So you're hit, okay, so you have up to two hundred and fifty thousand. Go find the IT person, go find the company that you're going to work with for notification, go find XYZ, um, which is a lot of burden on the company when, you know, that hits the fan. Um, Standalone policies, on the other hand, they'll have partners right off the bat knowing, okay, if this happens, here's where we're going for the um, forensic investigation, here's where we're going for notification. So everything's lined up and it's more streamlined. That being said, oftentimes if you have a vendor such as yourselves that you want to add to like a um like a panel vendor response uh, they had they have like a panel vendor response list almost like a panel council mm-hmm. you can add a preferred vendor to that list so you're basically telling the insurance company if this happens I want to use pearl for xyz a lot of times it's subject to approval by the insurance companies but um they're fairly understanding as long as you've been in business long enough and you have experience in the area, they should have no issue with that. Okay. Awesome. I appreciate the answer to those questions. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So uh, creating an information security policy, what does that even mean? Right? So we talked a lot about all the different problems you could have, and I'm just going to kind of go through these one at a time, but it's at the, at the very, very base level, you should have a backup or disaster recovery solutions, strategy, and then test that at least once a year. A lot of people do a backup and they don't really test it, right? There's no real quote unquote strategy about if your server is down or anything inside your organization is down, what does that mean? How do you get back up and then testing it? If you have multiple locations and you need what we call failover, you want to you know, move your information to another environment that gets you back up. We want to make sure you have that in place and you're doing that and you're testing it. Uh, next one is secure website. You wouldn't think about this. Not For some people, it may not even matter too much, um, but there's some very simple things that you can do, especially if you're doing some level of e-commerce on that website. You definitely want to secure your website. Um, you want to conduct regular vulnerability assessments, meaning that you want to have some company uh, or your IT person look at your environment and where are your weak spots? Where are you vulnerable? Uh, and you want to do that with some regularity as well, at least once a year, maybe more often, depending on the organization, how big you're building, how fast you're growing. Um, you want to use enterprise level antivirus software. A lot of people say they have antivirus software, but they really don't have antivirus software that's good. Norton Antivirus is an example of that. Not that it's not a great product. It's just not an enterprise level. It's not a corporate level antivirus product. You want to think about that and you want to pay for the right type of antivirus software. Uh, password management, access control. You want to come up with something, some password management. You want to have some policy around changing your passwords every, at least every maximum six months, probably a little less often than that or more often than that. Uh, you want to control who inside your organization has access to what. A lot of small companies, they won't even think about it. They'll give, the owner will give um, the controller access to everything or the office manager access to everything. And you have to remember those people you need to control their access as well, because if they someone hacks that person, they can then get access to everything else. So a lot of times people won't think about, we always call this word called access to like admin access or to the domain or something that around your network. But you just want to be careful. You want to think about that. And again, find someone that helps you understand that. 
Uh, and the next one to me is really the most important one. Evan talked about this, right? Building a risk aware culture. Are you training people? Are you monitoring the dark web? Uh, and you got to train people regularly. You got to do tests. You got to validate. You need to train your organization. Um, and it needs to be part of your staff meetings. If you're going to have a staff meeting every single quarter, talk about it every single quarter. If every six months, whatever you're doing, newsletters, uh, emails going out, training people, making them aware, find something that can help you do that. Um, you want to monitor the dark web, as I talked about, uh, there is valid, and you want to do it ongoing. You don't want it one time. Uh, you want to do it one time for sure to look at all the historical documents or all, all the historical accounts that have maybe have been hacked that are related to your organization. Uh, the person could have been gone for four or five years and happens to have an account that, for whatever reason, is still active. You just forgot about. Um, you want to be patching your systems. You want to create a software environment. Um, that every single computer, every single server, desktop computer, or laptop in your organization, uh, Windows updates are being happy. If your Windows updates aren't being happy, if the antivirus aren't being updated, you have vulnerabilities. So it just makes it, just making it easier for these hackers to come in and do something to you. Um, you want to encrypt sensitive data, uh, personal identifiable information, um, as Evan said, right? Even employee information is personal information that needs to be encrypted and pre-protected. And there's lots of ways to do that. There's lots of conversations we can have about that. Uh, but lastly, you know, look at if, if all this stuff is overwhelming, which for a lot of small to mid-market companies it is, uh, you want to hire a managed security services company uh, like Pearl or someone else that has a program. We look at 15 different areas in your organization, and we methodically go through and help you understand what needs to be changed, uh, what a program look like for you. And so you really want to hire somebody, hire a professional like anything else, find someone that can help you understand what they call layers of security to protect your business the right way. You don't need all of it necessarily. Uh, there's lots of different sophisticated tools that are on the market. Uh, find someone that can help you understand what those tools are and how it relates to your business and how you can protect yourself. Uh, so our, our process, uh, we come in and we evaluate your environment, your what we call ecosystem. Uh, what do you do today? What type of cybersecurity things are you doing? What are you not doing? Uh, we look at your cybersecurity maturity, um, and then we look at a risk, right? How, how risk adverse are you? Uh, regulatory is obviously a very big one. Healthcare environment is a very big one. Uh, manufacturing, construction, other companies are, are a little less, but we'll, we'll look at that together, and then we'll create a roadmap with you. So we'll, we'll look at all the different areas together. Um, what does an implementation, implementation look like? Maybe do one product you know, this month and the next one, next month, et cetera. And then how does it look ongoing? What you don't want to think about is just quote unquote implementation and that I've already taken care of it. It's, there's, it's gotta be ongoing. Cybersecurity is not something you do when you're done. Cybersecurity is ongoing. It's ever changing, it's ever evolving. You wanna stay on top of it uh, all the time. And so don't think about it as one and done. It's something you do every single day, every single month. Uh, and that's it for us. So uh, I appreciate you guys taking the time. I know it's uh, we ran a little long uh, than we do on some of our other webinars, but I thought, uh, Evan, you did a great job, man. I really appreciate it. Um, I think oh, we answered great. all the questions. If there's any more questions, let us know. But uh, it was it was great information. I, I, actually, I actually learned something for Pearl. So I, I appreciate you taking the time to help us learn a lot more. Absolutely, Greg. Glad to help. Uh, okay, so uh, reach out to us if you want to work with somebody, um, and we're happy to give you Evan's information. Uh, again, GBNA, um, great, great broker to work with um, if you need more information there too, and we can happy to share that. And Evan, we're going to send this out as a recording to everybody as well, so they'll see it, and so we'll put information on our website and everything too, so they know who to call if they want to talk about cybersecurity. Absolutely, Greg. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you all for watching. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.